Welcome and thank you for joining our webinar today, Supply Chain Security in the Era of COVID-19. My name is Peter Schumacher. I'm your webinar host for the day. I've got a few housekeeping items to cover before we get started. So first of all, this is a reminder that all attendee lines are muted. In an effort to keep this session interactive, we do invite you to submit your questions using the Zoom console. Time permitting, at the end of the hour, we're going to host a live Q&A with a broader audience included. Today's webinar is being recorded. We're going to send that recording out in the next day or so, so you receive a follow-up email with a link to that recording. Please look for that. We're joined today by Prevalent's very own Vice President of Third Party Risk, Brenda Ferraro, and Ponemon Institute Fellow and four-time CISO, Phil Agkawili. Phil and Brenda combined for, I won't say how many years of experience, but suffice it to say, many years of experience in both third-party risk and security in general. Uh, we're lucky to have them here today as our guest panelists, and I'm excited to take, hear their take on today's environment. I know you didn't join to hear my voice, so at this point, I'd like to turn things over to Brenda and Phil. Thanks so much for joining us today, and please take it away. Thank you, Peter. Hi, Phil. It's so good to be on this webinar with you. I hope you are well and safe. Yeah, we're doing great. Thanks a lot, Brenda. Great. And as I'm learning how to structure my work from home life balance, I've recognized that I have to create new boundaries for myself because with my passion of helping companies elevate their third party risk acumen for third party risk management, third party risk governance and risk management, it's extremely prevalent. Pardon for the literary, the, the literal pun there, but I'm excited to learn from you with the listeners today and to discuss items with you on new conventional and unconventional fundamentals that we need to realize as companies while we're building and, and moving forward. How are you doing through this time? Doing pretty well. I mean, uh, it's uh, brought a lot of change to everybody, obviously. I think it's actually brought some good rest <laughs> for, for a bunch of folks, but it's also uh, put, some, put a lot of strain where um, uh, and put a lot of good focus on the information technology folks out there doing good work. So uh, uh, trying to make it through just like everybody else. Yeah, exactly. So before we get started, let's type, kind of uh, set the stage. So every company has regulatory requirements that may have them drive their third party risk management programs or their security posture based on those regulations. And then there are some other companies in, in a different industry maybe that would drive their third party risk management company based on risk. So what are you seeing in the industry before we get started on some of these high level topic questions that I have created for us to talk about? I, I don't think you, anyone can go through the day without thinking um, about supply chain actually in third party risk management. Right, if you take a step out from the information technology space, kind of the digital realm, and think about what's going on around us, um, from the food that we eat to um, packages that we deliver or dinner or meals that we want, all of those now are being impacted by supply chain. And um, I think whether people recognize it or realize it or not, that supply chain is all predicated on um, who builds that um, that product that is, is needed to um, the, its logistics and supply chain of how it gets packaged, manufactured, and delivered to whatever intermediary uh, place like a, like a store, um, grocery store could be, all the way to how it gets into the consumer, consumer's home. And supply chain is uh, taking very much a, a, both from the physical world to the digital world, I think it's gone to the forefront. Um, the grocery space is uh, just so interesting to me. I, I think I've learned more about um, the toilet paper, <laughs> about toilet paper than I ever wanted to know. Uh, I think we've all learned. And um, who would have thought, right, that the toilet paper manufacturers, um, like here in Atlanta, Georgia Pacific, um, you know, their supply chain is predicated on very complex um, logarithmic algorithms that basically determine business toilet paper because it's different types of toilet paper delivered to businesses or people go and drive into for their office. 
to toilet paper that makes it into someone's home, which is, again, produced a different way. Um, it's manufactured a different way, and it's delivered a different way through grocery stores and, and other um, consumer channels. And, um, you know, that's one example I thought would be really interesting to talk about or um, touch base on every so often. And then the other side is um, I'm sure, you know, Zoom, who we're on today in this, we in this webinar, never thought about it, ramifications of a pandemic impacting them, but their entire supply chain has, has been called into question. Um, and, and I'm not calling out Zoom specifically, but they've been in the news a lot. But um, their entire supply chain from who their third party, fourth parties are, um, to their overall internal security practices. And so, again, and then how businesses are using that, and then what impact those businesses um, believe that they face and the risk appetite they believe that they have um, in doing business with a company like Zoom. So I just want to, you know, to me, like, uh, if people don't realize it or not, supply chain is a, and third-party risk management is a, is a huge topic facing everybody. Yeah, it really is. And when you talk about the grocery stores and being a cybersecurity mind, when I started to use either Instacart or some of the different types of delivery services, I've met up really a lot of nice people, but at the same time, I thought about my credit card going onto an application and me not having the opportunity to vet that particular vendor for myself to, to understand if they had all of their security vendor building and maturity model type responses to some company that says, yes, I'm looking at my static and my dynamic code scans and I do have a, a real tight security acumen with regards to making sure that I am reducing defects. So yeah, it's just basically becoming one of the norms. So talking about that, um, it's going to be very interesting as we move forward within this different threat landscape of what's the different risk management disciplines or what the company esteem is going to be because that will be reflected on how each company is reacting and are preparing to address the shifting security controls. And I really don't see in the trends that the security controls are changing to different uh, that critical controls aren't remaining critical controls. We're just adding additional ones because we didn't know that they were going to be critical. So we may have had lists of third parties that were telling us, here's our top 500 vendors, or here's our top 50 or top 20 vendors because of the criticality to our business. We're now realizing that there are different businesses and or engagements with third parties that have become more critical because we needed to change the way we were working and or living. Um, why do you feel that third party, outside of what we just already talked about, is important now or more important now? Yeah, so I'll actually add a third um, example in this era of supply chain, right? So companies that are vertically aligned in what they produce, so companies like Tesla, who create their own batteries, they build their own parts, basically, versus a Ford or a Chevy or a Ferrari that has tons of other third parties that provide parts to their overall product. How hard is it for them to still build what they're trying to build when, they're, um, when they have a widespread supply chain versus a vertically integrated type company versus like Tesla? Um, the other examples I gave earlier, the toilet paper and Zoom also starts in, starts asking those questions on, well, um, from Zoom's own internal security, how good is their application security practices to where does their data route through, where do their phone calls route through, um, which is now in question from the Department of Homeland Security, um, whether or not it's being routed through China or not. Those questions are, um, prior to a crisis, should be asked. Um, and. But what to me, what's going on now and why it becomes very important is asking those right questions, right? And starting to start asking yourself, well, when it comes to our business, what's our risk appetite? And when you start asking those questions on what's our risk appetite, you start asking up deeper questions on, well, what are we, what are we believe our risks are? And what are our risks working with these vendors? And, um, um, and kind of like a back into the, the, 
the idea around supply chain when it comes to groceries. Does it take a presidential order for a meatpacking company to go back to work for them to actually give put meat back into our supply chain? Or we heard, I think, in the last couple of weeks, right, um, the cow, uh, cows and milk, right? Why are we, we don't we don't have to waste that milk? What's wrong with your supply chain, um, local farmer? On um, why can't you get that milk to um, people that will actually drink it instead of you having to to waste it down the drain? And so supply chain again is one of those one of those huge areas where you start asking yourself, well, if we're all holding hands, whose hand am I holding, and what what importance do they have to me? And um, especially in this era, right? So if I'm holding your hand, like, did you wash your hands? <laughs> um, did you take the necessary hygiene safety steps to make sure that after I'm holding your hand, you're not getting me sick? And again, if we take that into the digital world, that you start asking yourself all these questions on what are, what's important to me, what are high risk areas for me, and what what are the important questions that I be asking? And um, for me, that's where third-party risk management just absolutely shines. And um, that's where I think – so I'm, I've, m- most of my history has been inside of the information technology domain and in um, leading cybersecurity functions for the last 30 years. And for me, what I have – from my experience, from telecom to critical manufacturing to financial services and banking – um, and to just pure internet companies has been, I'm, I'm typically working in, from a third party risk management perspective and supply chain perspective, I'm typically working with two groups that actually have more power and political clout um, and business leadership than, than the information security organization. And I'm typically working either with the operations organizations that either come directly through the chief operations officer or with the head of legal. Um, uh, or the chief financial officer. So those organizations in that one operational umbrella um, start making me think a little bit differently than just pure cyber. So uh, CFO talks about kind of the financial risk, right, and operational risk to the company and strategic risk through a finance lens. The um, general counsel will have me take a look with a different lens when it comes to um, uh, a you know, legal legal exposure, risk exposure, and also through um, uh, the regulatory compliance um, side, which most information security folks tend to get nervous about just focusing on kind of the compliance piece, but that's huge. Um, and and kind of the other the other area that um, for me that I want to focus I want to focus on with them is kind of the strategic and operational risk when it comes to kind of the cyber threat um, area. And there's a lot of coaching and education on my side that I typically have to give. I'm not sure, Brenda, like I know I'm talking a lot here, so uh, what experience you've had in this space, but what what are you seeing in this area today? Phil, you make a lot of really good points, and I see all of those, plus the fact that programs are really comprehensive when it comes to third-party risk management. And there are different types of domains within the life cycle of third party risk that if you've got a break in the ability to either one know who your third parties are like you talked about you need to know who you're holding hands with or you're daisy chained with doing services with or you might have a break within understanding context to what the risk really is by working with those companies, whether they're third parties, fourth parties, or nth parties. And then what we realized today is that if you don't know what your risk is and you don't know how those daisy chain connections are and you don't know who the third parties are in your portfolio, there really isn't a way for any executive to ask for any information based on the fact of how are we going to be impacted because you don't know the domino effect that's going to take place, whether a person is impacted that is a subject matter expert or whether it's a company as a whole that can't provide the service or the product anymore. So your examples are spot on. And I think that the reason why third party is more important today is because we have that bright shining light on supply chain 
on products being delivered, on services being available, from anything of the digital technology to even resources and or the way that we're getting what we need to get from life and or business. So let's kind of jump into the next item that I have um, for us to talk about, which is, you know, how do we realize the most important area of improvement? If there are so many different levels of third party risk, whether it's based on compliance mandates or fines that we might receive, or it's based on the risks that we identify, sometimes it becomes very cumbersome in efforts to know where do we start. So I'm a big fan of um, industry standards. I'm a big fan of um, practices that um, simplify repetitive redundant activity. And again, in my experience at, in multiple industry sectors, critical um, industry sectors, what I found over and over again is there's the same questions are being asked. And for me, what I found kind of a way to really jumpstart and really improve um, this area is take a look at where, um, try to get an understanding of where kind of the, the, the same questions are being asked over and over again. And I think any, anybody that spent a little time in supply chain um, and in information security that does third party risk management and legal who does contract security, they, they start seeing trends. And so back, wow, um, um, uh, almost 15 years ago, um, in my time at a critical manufacturing company, um, uh, what I found was I was getting hundreds of questionnaires every week from um, my supply chain asking the same questions over and over again. And at the time, um, there was no function, but the company where I was at was buying, um, bought more than half a dozen cloud companies. And so I turned around and looked at the leader of that company and I said, hey, we're going to keep getting these and it's going to keep crushing us with these, um, these questionnaires. If we don't have a way to harmonize, you know, harmonize the question set and then give them the same answers back to instead of 100 questionnaires, we can fill out one of our own generic questionnaires and then send them back our responses to the most prevalent consistent questions. And so one of the things that in Scott's intro that I didn't share with you all is um, 15 years ago, I was one of the co-founders of, of a group called the Cloud Security Alliance. And that's when cloud started really becoming more important out there. Um, I am one of the co-founders, co-authors of the Cloud Controls Matrix. Um, that's a controls matrix around cloud. And um, I'm trying to get to the answer to your question. <laughs> and um, um, interestingly enough, like one of my friends that I met, uh, he took the questions, he took the controls that uh, I had, um, myself and the other founders had built and built the questionnaire around it called the um, cloud, it's cloud Security Alliance um, Consensus Assessment Initiative, um, Assessments Initiative, um, the CAI. And, um, and basically it was, a, at the time, it was 99, it boiled it down from um, 150 controls down to 99 questions to go ask. And so what it did for me at that time at that critical manufacturer was build, um, respond to all 99 questions. And so instead of getting um, 100 questionnaires from my customers, I already had pre-baked answers to 99 questions that we had pre-answered that were authorized by a wide variety, again, the operations, organizations, legal, finance, um, and information security, and we can quickly respond back to the, the questions. What was interesting 15 years ago was in the financial services sector, especially in banking, the banks were getting the same set of questions, well, in kind of the finance space. And so um, BitSig arose from that, and that's you know, the group that basically created a standardized information gathering um, request. And then if you look at in the last couple of years and just enacted recently, um, the Department of Defense in the United States created something called the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. So all of these are methodologies to quickly improve how we take controls, apply them to our environment, um, create a questionnaire, and then an answer set that we can 
standardize and harmonize um, and give back um, in a generic form to any customer asking the question. And the neat part is, fine, a customer turns around and gives me a 300-question questionnaire. What I have found is in the 300 questions, there's a lot of redundant questions. It's like they're asking a psychology test, giving, me a, or giving my team a psychology test, and asking the same question multiple ways to see if we're not being truthful or whatever rationale that they have. And what I found is by um, sticking to your guns and kind of um, utilizing these, frame, these, um, uh, these question at standardized questionnaires, and going back one by one and saying, well, what questions weren't answered? And a lot of times you'll have to hop on a phone call. It's a way to simplify the three to 500. I've literally seen, I've seen vendors that have given 500 question questionnaires and I've had to sit through conference calls to give them a sense of understanding and ease um, to get beyond kind of this psychology test slash um, brutal compliance regime that's really kind of engulfed pretty much every industry. And I think that's what, what would simplify and, and massively improve uh, the industry is you got to use these questionnaires that are out there. And then um, the last piece, and this is I think where pre companies like Prevalent come in, is then use the automated tools that have kind of arisen to support those automated questionnaires and control sets and measuring and scoring systems to kind of give a cohesive view. By the way, on top of all that is um, – uh, there are these standards bodies that they have attestations and certifications that they provide. Um, when a company can go and, you know, sit through the DOD's CMMC certification, when that becomes um, uh, there's, uh, fully enacted, and then, um, you know, with other organizations that, that have ISO 27001, if you're in information security, to uh, provide an attestation for your um, security management infrastructure, how you're managing security at your company, it also gives another way for companies to have a, a good sense of what security is being done um, at a company. So I know I gave a whole ton there. We may want to unpack um, this, this whole area when it comes to standards, controls, questionnaires, tools, and certifications. Yeah, I think what's interesting about what you said was as we're going through, the, the regulations are going to most likely change or definitely change based on what we're experiencing. And everyone jumped on the bandwagon to say, okay, what is the business resilience questionnaire that we need to send out that's limited in scope of information to gather? And I'm finding that some companies are going back to their business units to say, okay, what does this company do for us? Please let us know based on their contract. And then there are some other companies that are taking the approach of saying, in efforts for us to maintain resilience and preparedness, we want to go to the vendors and ask them, here are some things that I need to know about your company and what you're doing with our work so that we can bump that up and cross-reference it with what our knowledge is and really become very tight in the perceptions and or the accuracy of what we're doing together. So the business resilience is definitely going to be coming into play. The risk relationships, there is a feature within our platform which I adore and love. And it's because you're able to look at the information that's gathered from whatever questionnaire it is, and you can see the differences of responses based on the mapping. So for example, you spoke about the shared, um, the shared assessment SIG. With the SIG, um, what's coming in the very, very near future is that you'll be able to see a question that's been asked in one security domain section that relates to a question that's responded to in another security domain question. There's two different approaches to look at that. One, the responses are different because there's a vulnerability, or two, the responses are different, but there's a compensating control that can be taken into effect for one of the respondents responses that were unfavorable. So there's a way to see a full pane of glass. It's not really saying, hey, we need you to answer all these things because we're gaming the system. It's more, you're really answering the questions, but we're also realizing that there are some things that we can take into account, but whether it's a true vulnerability or it's a compensating control that can be taken into account for something that's been reflected as unfavorable. 
The CAIQ, just, just to let you know, we were, um, I went to a summit today for shared assessments and Jim Ralph brought up the hexagon. So the CAIQ is still very live and a lot of companies are asking for that. And we're seeing an uptick in the CAIQ as one of the harmonized or consistent standards for the cloud environment. And then we're now seeing a shift in trend in the companies where they're saying, okay, yeah, you're asking me to fill out all these questionnaires and I know that I have to get to them. Here's what I have. So there's this new, you know, excuse the grammar, give me what you got approach. And they're taking what they have, whether it's a standard SIG, whether it's a HISAC, whether it's a CAIQ, whether it's a different standard, like a prevalent control framework, and they're receiving that information to say, okay, I'm going to take this and I'm going to look at the risks based on what you're giving me, because you're right, the questions are being asked in every other standard in maybe a different way, but the same intent. So we're trying to stop the questionnaire fatigue madness by give me what you got. So yeah, what, I, what I love and just to, what, what I love and just, to, you know, a little bit of insight that back in 2008, when we, we, started writing the cloud controls matrix, um, the controls matrix, um, we actually wrote it with the intention of not inventing a whole new controls framework. The intention was we took 15 other um, security control standards across multiple industries and just aligned them. We harmonized them because the goal there was, well, you know, what, it, most people just generically, here, I'll, I'll just get you talking some more, Brenda. Um, Tell me, like, what what what's the ba what are basic practices, basic requirements for a good password? For a good like, password, like, oh, yeah, like it depends yeah. on the company, of course, but you have to have more than eight characters. There has to be like a a special character, a capital, whatever that might be. But then some people are going towards no passwords, and they're doing things that can check what your phone is doing in efforts to make sure that you're coming in through a, a particular venue, but. There are standards, and so I, I'm hoping that's answering your question, but they're all pretty yeah, much, no. here's the heightened so you're, so you're totally on it. I mean, so the funny part is if you go to ISO 27001 or NIST 853 or ENISA or COBIT or NERC SIP, the, the beauty what we built in the cloud control, controls framework was all intention of, hey, if we take a look at all of them all together and we start looking at, okay, this one says eight, minimum. This one says six. Okay, so let's take eight is more than six. Let's take that as eight is the minimum instead of six because there's more. And then 12 is kind of, ooh, 15 is kind of, okay, let's, okay, 12 is probably somewhere like on the art of doable. We start harmonizing the ones across the board. That's what we did with the controls matrix. We, we intentionally took all of them, lined them up. Um, I know when I was, um, I'll just say the company, when I was at Dell with my team that was helping build that, and I had just come from Cisco, and so the Cisco WebEx team, interestingly enough, WebEx, <clears throat> um, so the Cisco team and the Dell team, when we got together and we're looking at them online together, we're like, hey, look, so there's, there's these common th themes right here. Why don't we just take the common themes and just put them together, and it starts gluing these together, harmonizing them, and that starts giving a sense of what's what all of them are asking is the basic tenets of what they believe is good password security. You know, you expand that over hundreds of controls and you start realizing there's some common truths across every single industry. So I just want to put that out there because I think that's what's, you know, when, when people start doing these, uh, this, you know, this, this questionnaire fatigue on everybody, I'm like, you're at, yeah, you know, you're not a, you're not a unique snowflake. Everybody, <laughs> someone's asked that question before. Right. And um, I'm giving you the answer. And if you don't like the answer, then we should probably talk through that until you have a better understanding of um, what we have a better understanding of what you're trying to get to, to what we're trying to tell you generically to every, and telling everybody else. Yeah, a lot of the companies are starting to think about key controls, just like the one that you mentioned. And they're taking those key controls and they're applying it to whatever questionnaire that's coming in. So their, their glue is actually their risk tolerance and appetite based on the key controls that are important to the company. And then they're accepting the information that's being fed to them from the vendors in many different formats or artifacts or questionnaires or responses. And then they're able to view in their risk view exactly what items need to be mitigated and or are acceptable. 
So if we've got all of these things that we're trying to harmonize, or we've got questionnaires and risk scoring, threat intelligence, and every different thing that's coming at us, knowing that the CAIQ or other standards are trying to accomplish the harmonization, how do we know, you know, with a rubber band, it can only be stretched so far before it breaks. How do we resist that urge to rotate too far during our current environmental situation so that we're doing the right thing at the right time? I mean, I think companies have to, if they don't have one already, I think they have to uh, determine what their risk appetite is in, in a wide variety of areas. Uh, I've been in the industry again for 30 years, so I'm a big fan of what ISACA built out of the Enterprise Risk Management Model, ERM. Um, the ERM is founded on four foundational um, risk areas, um, financial risk, strategic risk, operational risk, and regulatory compliance risk. And um, for me, it's understanding what those four areas are and then kind of branching underneath those four. Cybersecurity, information security tends to um, live inside of operation, the kind of the operational risk uh, pillar. Also in the regulatory compliance pillar, there are impacts in the financial risk pillar and in the strategic risk areas as well. But um, you know, predominantly the information security people We'll talk about cyber risk as it pertains to operational risk and also regulatory compliance risk. Well, the reason why I kind of bring the ERM up, is, the COSO ERM up, is you know if you want to not swing too far in the pendulum, I think everybody has. I think people have felt it. You know, almost nine years, ten years ago, I started seeing a lot of people kind of pushing back, saying compliance is not cybersecurity, is not equivalent to security. And you know, people saying, uh, you know, if you're compliant, doesn't mean you're actually secure. And then, you know, probably about five years ago, I started hearing more and more that hey, privacy and security are not the same either. Uh, you can you can be secure, but maybe not have privacy, and you may not have privacy if you have security. So I think just kind of swinging the pendulum too far. I think people do have to have a have their antennas up and they have to be maniacal to say, hey, is this just, is this just um, pushing too hard on the, the compliance route? I don't know if, you know, you, you've had a ton of industry experience. How about you? What, what, what's your sense in this area? So many of the things that happen with me is when I'm helping a company to develop their program and mature their program, it, it turns into the question of, are you doing process for process sake? really everything that you do needs to have a reason and an action. So if we're looking at risk and we're identifying a risk, why do you wanna know it? And if it matches your risk tolerance or your appetite and you need something to be done, whether it's mitigate or not mitigate, there needs to be triggers. So if an event occurs, then yes, reassess the company. If a, a breach happens, find out all the interconnections or the daisy chain of your nth parties and how that affects your business. If it's something with regards to a process because you want to track something, make sure you're tracking it automated instead of manually um, and inform the people who need to be informed. So as long as you strategically think about how you are creating your program with the right processes, with the right talent, with the right system and platform, and getting the information to the right people, then I think that that will kind of keep you in a, a rail path of exactly where your guardrails are and, and not to supersede or go over in any pendulum perspective. But I definitely see some companies that all of a sudden say, oh my gosh, we have to do X, Y, and Z because now we're living in a different threat environment. Let's go make it happen right now. And it puts a stress on a certain area, department, vendor approach. And you have to kind of take that with an empathetic approach and, and thoughtfulness to say, we know that everybody is getting hit left and right with what are you doing? How are you staying afloat? How are you going to make sure our supply chain is also happening within our timelines or at least with negotiated timelines now? Because, you know, with Amazon, it's not coming in your prime one or two days. So you have to say, okay, Amazon's still good. It's just that they're being impacted like all of us. So we have to make sure that we're giving them some leniency. Um, or with the children who are, are um, at home with all of the parents. And we, we noticed that there might've been some latencies or some glitches with our stay at home recourses of here, 
son or daughter, I'm going to let you watch maybe an hour of Disney because I need to get some work done. <laughs> so there was a lot oh, of yeah. things Disney had to think about too, I'm sure, or other types of um, applications that we're able to share with our children for learning and education. But that's kind of what I'm yeah, saying there. Yeah to, me, yeah, to me as an as an executive, I don't know if we're ever going to be able to get away from, you know, slamming into one guardrail or the other, especially at the levels that I've been at. Um, for me, what's what's been interesting as well, I need to think ahead, and my team needs to help think ahead and be prepared. We need to be looking at what those risks are, and what our threat landscape looks like, start addressing, making sure that we're strategically, architecturally, operationally um, uh, putting the right controls in place and be ready to take those questions. You know, so this pandemic, for example, is a great example, right? Because if you look even like six years ago, um, when the target breach happened, right? Target, the target breach happened and it was all about third party um, remote access at that time. It was, um, they had an HVAC vendor through their VPN that had access their environment. So, right, so the immediate question comes back from the executives is, hey, do we have the same flaw? Well, what, tell me about our HVAC vendors. And I, I turned around and I'm like, well, let me tell you about all of our <laughs> um, <laughs> vendors that have remote access. Right? Right. They come in through these links over here. This is, um, our, um, our this is our strategy and architecture to mitigate any kind of impact of that, act, that type of access coming from here. Here's how we monitor them. And then here's what we do with our procurement organization to talk about our supply chain agreements on what they know that they're allowed to do and not do contractually in the environment. Because before that, um, I was in the telecom space, and I've answered a very similar question to that on, hey, we're you're starting to outsource our, our call centers. How do we minimize threat? And I'm like, well, let me tell you about research we did several years before that and talked about the breaches that happened at Comcast and AT&T. And, um, uh, and here's what happened with their third parties that accesses their network through their call center breaches that had happened. And, um, you know, those may not be the best examples, but I think, I think the responsibility lies in the operational teams to think about, especially with my security, what threats are thinking ahead and then documenting what, what those threats are and what the risks are to the business and then what, control, what controls and mitigations are, are in place. Because for me, um, it, it really, a lot of it really kind of came to head working in the, the banking sector. The, the main regulators that I was working with, the Office of the Control of Currency through the Department of Treasury, the Federal Reserve Board, they, the different part if you're not in a regulated industry that, that you, you learn to, you, you gain a really strong understanding on is, um, you know, these regulators they come back. They come back every year. You can't. You shouldn't. You shouldn't hide. Um, I don't think you should be that way in any industry. By the way, if you're in this space, like, hey, you're not. You know, we're not kind of fooling anybody. You got to do the right thing all the time. And um, uh, you, the biggest thing that you realize they're coming back all the time, and you have you you need to keep maintain your A game. Because when they come back, they're going to have last year's, the year before, and in my instance, they had decades of institutional knowledge of assessments, of audits, uh, being in my environment to come back and say, hey, five years ago, here's how you, how your, this organization answered these questions, and the answers are different now. And my answer time and time again was based off of fact and of truth and integrity, which is, well, in my time at here, here's what we have done, and here's what we shored up. Here were the, the, the gaps that we found, and here's um, our investments that we made, and here's, um, here's what we believe in our own testing, both internal and external, what we've done, and here's the external attestations that we've done, external audits that we've done through these other regulators or attestation bodies, um, like the ISO 27001 certification that my last group obtained, and, and to show, like, hey, we have a consistent process that we have through multiple bodies to demonstrate that we're, we're doing all of these right things. And the gap, er the gap areas that I, I self-identified, those are ones you, you can hold me accountable for that I don't fix. And the ones that I find, and so the ones that I, you know, Donald Rumsfeld, the unknown unknowns, I'm, 
maniacally looking to uncover the unknown unknowns because that's what's going to kill me as a chief information security officer. When I don't know and I can't answer those questions in a fairly short period of time, that's when my executives, the boards that I've reported into, have come back on top of me on not understanding my environment and not doing my duty. And to me, I hold, uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, maybe it's not in my voice today, but, uh, you know, I, um, you know, to me, like, uh, there's no other high integrity job than being um, the chief information security officer at a company today. Because to me, um, cybersecurity is pretty much impacts every company, even a mom and pop a grocery store, mom and pop cleaner, um, cupcake shop. But somewhere along the way, cybersecurity um, uh, it will impact that organization. And for me, it's uh, being able to attest for it and go back and say, hey, we've kind of fallen back. Like since last time we checked, we need to shore that up. And that's now a gap again. And to go back to my team to figure out well, why did that fall off the radar and put in the right processes like you mentioned earlier Brenda like it's not the, it's not a process to make a process we're putting that process because we fell down with the old process and where's the checking process behind that to check it and this is where if you're in financial services that you start hearing about the lines of defense the three lines of defense this is where all three lines of defense have to work in concert not be adversarial and be there to make sure that policy wise we're doing the right thing operationally wise we're implementing the right areas and upholding those every day. And then we, um, you know, with, with the third line, auditing them on a regular basis to make sure that we're, it's still there and it's functioning correctly. And then really kind of figuring out like what processes are um, efficient and um, doable and, um, and really kind of talk about like which ones do we just struggle with. And I think to me that's, um, I'm, I'm, I guess I jumped into this next question already, but <laughs> This is kind of where trust is. It's like, well, you have multiple bodies within a company and outside of the body that are testing for stuff. That's how we, we show trust. If there's, a, if there's an external organization um, um, that's out there doing an ISO 27001 annual certification uh, or every three-year certification, um, but two years follow-up every year um, annual reattestation, and then there's the OCC from the Department of Treasury uh, coming in, and um, if the Federal Reserve Board is coming in, eventually a lie will be exposed. Eventually a, a non-truth will be, probably a lie is be kind of a strong word, but a non-truth will be exposed. Um, the truth will eventually it rear its head. And to me, that's kind of when, um, you know, you have to, that's how you can validate trust, is you have multiple bodies in there. You can also, it, you can also show, you know, your last time of breach. You can show these attestations, and um, all of these frameworks, all of these questionnaires are out there, attestations and certifications, um, SOC 2s, SOC 1s, SSA 16s, right? All these certifications that are out there are um, CMMC through the DOD. They're all there to, to give that level of trust. So, I, <laughs> sorry, I just jumped into no, the that area. Was that was great. So in, in line with integrity, um, we're going to be facing, I have to, I skipped a slide. I'm going to go back. So we're facing things at a rapid pace. So with our attack surface and it's fundamentally changing and we're identifying our different risks to deal with what we need to, we've got the three lines of defense in place. We're harmonizing questionnaires. Do, can we really trust what we're seeing today during an emergency or, or what do we need to do in that situation? I mean, yeah, I, I'm a firm believer in facts. I mean, the, the, we have to go on, go on our thing based off of facts, right? If we, for example, today, right, if we, if we need, you know, personal protection equipment, PPEs, and they need to be shipped to the hospital, right? Can that hospital order that equipment? Can they entrust that that equipment's coming to them? Can they entrust that, that the PPE that's getting to them is actually certified and true? And at the end of the day, I think in times of urgency, you have to you have to rely on what you don't do in times of emergency. I mean, um, people that have worked for me in the past, I call it, you know, wartime versus peacetime. You know, all the all the work that you've done during peacetime manifests itself during wartime. And for me, it's um, or when there's if there's a breach or there's a possible breach. So all the things that you're doing in that peacetime, 
you have to rely on that in the times of emergency, and that's what you trust is the work that was done before that. And I think during that peacetime, those activities that you've done, when you're not under duress, you have to rely on that. And if um, it turns out during the emergency that there was a failure, you have to go back and you have to hold people accountable, and then you have to go resolve those. And um, here's the other thing. I think in peacetime, you have to constantly be doing drills, um, putting your putting the entire organization in times of emergency. So I'm going to give just I'm going to give a total like a uh, uh, props to my son's high school he goes to. So my son goes to a private school that is a Google supported uh, Google supported high school, meaning they use Google Classrooms, they use the wide variety of the Google tools. Uh, he's a freshman. So five times this year, before the pandemic hit, they had five, five times where the students stayed at home and they did remote schooling to test all the remote systems of, of, um, those, of the students. So when the, the pandemic hit, the announcement for the state of Georgia happened on a Thursday to start um, to, to, for all the schools to go home. And so on Friday, without missing a beat, he flipped, he flipped on his, his laptop for school and started doing schoolwork, and he's been hard at it ever since. So he basically wakes up at 7.30 in the morning for 7.45 a.m. high school and then starts class, and then he comes out of his, his room around 3 o'clock, 3.30, finishing his last classes and doing, starting some of his homework, and then grabs some food. So he's, hard, he's, he's head on. Even What's even kind of blown me away is during gym class, uh, physical education, uh, he looked at me the first day and he's like, do you want me to run outdoors or do you want me to just run in our home gym? And I'm like, just run on the treadmill. And so he goes down and hits the gym in my basement and he, he, uh, lifts weights and he, he runs and he works out, you know, for the time he's supposed to be in gym class. And then he takes a shower and goes right back to his regular classes. And in the, in the companies that I've worked at, some of the better companies that I've been at have practiced everybody work remotely. Maybe not everybody, but different sites, different groups, and sometimes some of the better companies, they've done everybody work remote, and they've stressed the remote VPNs before any of this pandemic ever started. But I think if you if you take that as a, um, a best practice, like in peacetime, oh, you better practice all your emergency practices. You better practice what your, your business continuity plan. I think from a supply chain perspective, a third-party risk management perspective, a lot of companies haven't really – driven really hard because I mean, I'm going to say it a lot of places where I've been what I've noticed when it comes to third party risk management and supply chain procurement practices very much a uh, very much a a compliance practice hey do we have a backup supplier great well have we ever activated the backup supplier no <laughs> um, I know on the cybersecurity side like I've um, pushed a lot on the information security cybersecurity uh, let's 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 activate our BCP business continuity plan and see how all that works, and let's see how it fails. Just turn off the data center, turn off the power. I mean, I I've, I've literally walked in with a new CIO, <laughs> and I've watched them hit the button in the data center and turn everything off on the fly. Um, and uh, wow, I mean, all the it was amazing to see what didn't come back up. And again, if we expand that to supply chain, you you can do this for your third parties. Yeah, and, I'm uh, of that, and I'm so glad that your son had that situation because there's a lot of schools that did not. There's any universities that are listening today. That's something that you're going to want to put in your docket for as soon as you can test it out. But I, I totally agree. Look, we have 10 minutes. I could talk to you all day, but I'm going to move us next to the uh, next item of, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges that we face today um, that we haven't already mentioned? Uh, from what I've, from, again, from my experience, the biggest challenge that we face is that um, it, it's, it's overwhelming, this space, and uh, a majority of the time, uh, it this area just absolutely just devolves into compliance. And uh, to me, when, when to avoid that, I think if companies really focus, like I said in the beginning, is what, where's your, understand what your risk appetite is and really focus on that, it's the simplicity, right? And, um, you know, I think 
Steve Jobs is the one that basically said it the best um, around simplicity. It, 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 simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. sophistication. And um, I, I think if you if you don't maniacally focus on what you need to, what are your highest risks, and really kind of say what are our highest risks when it comes to third party, our third parties, and and maybe break it down in, into some of these areas: our operational risk, our regulatory compliance risk, our strategic risk, our financial risk areas. I think if we start there and focus there consistently, I think that's where we're going to be. Um, I think that's I think that's our biggest challenge: is the complexity of it all. Because again, when I when you ask me about you know end party security, and then I, I know I'm kind of jumping ahead to the next slide again, but <laughs> and fourth party fourth party security. If you don't do third party risk management right, just who your third parties are, then you have no shot at you know kind of the fourth party end party um, security. Yeah. And if you don't know what your your highest risk areas of focus are, then I think the biggest challenges that we face today is just not not being able to to know and then articulate what our what our highest risks are. And I think you can apply that across the entire information security industry. I mean, if I was, I mean, I, I've heard um, uh, healthcare, especially hospital CISOs or security leaders speak, and what's really kind of really kind of piqued my curiosity when they've spoken is, well, our highest risk is not about cyber risk. Their high, when, when I've heard them speak, they're like, our highest risk is like not killing patients. Loss of life. And yeah, it's loss of life, right? And so for me, it's like, okay, if you can have that kind of focus, then expand it out. Well, you know, I, I'm in information security, so I'm kind of focused around kind of the, the technology of saving patient lives and making sure, I'm like, well, okay, so remote access starts kind of popping in my head. You know, and remote access can, can be more than just remote access. Remote access could be, well, what about a, you know, someone that, a patient that comes in over Wi-Fi? Can they access our intranet it, the same way they access our VPN? So start asking these questions. And I think, I think that's, if you're, inform, for the folks that are on the call that are information security or audit IT teams or information security teams, I think that's, you have to kind of go through scenarios and talk about consequences of those scenarios. And then you have to talk about countermeasures. And I think that's kind of where, when you talk about challenges that we face today, the biggest challenge is not actually understanding and thoughtfully going through as deep as you can, and then documenting what those are in kind of the knowns. And then you, know, you have a document of what the knowns are, then you have a document of um, what's known but unexamined. And then you have another, then you start building a list of the unknowns. And the unknowns are things that we find out from industry peers. And so, so one of the other biggest challenges that I think they're out there is there, you know, nobody is a unique snowflake. No organization stands alone. Even I brought up Tesla as a vertically integrated company. Even the Teslas of the world have peers in the industry. And so what I recommend to a lot of people is to join these information sharing centers that are out there, ISACs, information sharing and now centers, and then finding out, well, what's impacting the other group, other organizations just like us, your peers, or to get benchmarks, or to work with our regulators if you're regulated on, well, what's important to the regulators that you see across all of the other companies like us? Because at the end of the day, you know, again, my space is um, information security, cybersecurity. If, you're not, if you haven't been hacked, then somebody in your peer group has been. So my question always is, is, how were they hacked? What was the root cause? And your insurance company can probably help you. Your regulators can help you if you're in banking. And to get, get root cause, or going out to the industry and asking, when I was in telecom, I went back out to the other telecoms to ask, hey, so you know, what is this telecom DDoS? I didn't know what it was back in 2009 when I first heard it. But when Verizon started talking about um, TDDoS that was popping up, you know, it opened my eyes. I'm like, hey, do we have to watch for this? I went back to our telecom teams. And so, you know, our biggest challenge is, you know, again, documenting the knowns, documenting the knowns but unreviewed. By the way, the reviews have to happen religiously um, and then start, you know, categorizing the unknowns, um, the unknown unknowns, and then running after those and then being prepared to be able to speak across the board. And 
Um, you know, in my day, because I've been doing this for three decades, uh, I've used GRC tech technologies to document that stuff. There are newer technologies, you know, to you, Brenda and the Fellow team, um, but there are new tech technologies that can start documenting that for yourselves and for other for third parties. I think starting to understand those and kind of reviewing them on a consistent basis on threats, consequences, countermeasures, gaps, risks, and then putting, you know, bubbling them up on risk appetite, which are your highest ones, and then consistently reviewing them is, um, I think, the, to me, I, I put them as challenges because those are, um, you have to know what you don't know. Nice. <laughs> and to me, as a, as a chief information security officer, I've always told people, like, hey, the things that I don't know about is what's going to get me fired. So my, my responsibility to you folks that are my people is you need to tell me what those, what those problems are. And, um, and so I'll end this biggest challenge is with this. I've been in corporate America for, again, for a long time. What your executives don't know is what's going to get them and your company. And what I say straight and, and forward with is this part of the industry needs to uphold at the highest levels of integrity and ethics and integrity because um, you have to understand and you have to analyze what the control is. You have to understand and understand what the question, the questionnaire is asking, and you have to answer that with, with, with all the integrity and ethics that you have because even if it turns out you're not doing the right thing because that's your chance to go fix something. And what I find over and over again is there's in the industry, um, and this is where I think why things devolve into compliance is because people are afraid of um, a bad answer. And I think as an industry, uh, bad answers are good. And this is why I think the third line should be easier on the second and the first line of defense, at least in the financial services sector and the banking sectors, because um, bad answers are good. That's exposure of potential risk. And I think instead of using those as kind of a um, uh, beating people up, I think we should use those as kind of a carrot and we should expose, like, self-attestations are there, self-identified issues are out there because we need to be able to identify them and get, have a chance to go resolve those issues, even if they're just big and scary and very complex. And I think that's the biggest challenge. I think a lot of people, it's easier just to bury your head in the sand. So there's a part of the industry, there's part of um, organizations that are out there that say, I'd rather ignore trying to figure out what those unknown unknowns are and I'll deal with them when the reg I violated a regulation or a law. And I think that's why GDPR ultimately exists. And, you know, when I look at GDPR, I look at uh, pretty much a, a pretty large-scale compliance regulation that cropped up. And, um, my, my, and, and um, you know, spending time with the PCI industry, I think that's where there's been a lot of bad behavior with PCI DFS where people, you know, they raise their shields for the time of their attestation and, well, what happens for the rest of the year? Are those shields still up or are you not doing those things now or do they just fall off? And, um, you, know, it's, you know, when you look at in the industry and, you know, being part of the Poneman Institute, you know, a majority of the vulnerabilities, most of the big breaches out there are from things that are covered inside of these controls. And why are we still having these big breaches and simple breaches going on if, I thought you said you were doing that, and that's it, that's what throws into question these attestations when people aren't necessarily um, answering them to the to the level that they should be, or they're not being held accountable to these attestations on a more regular basis. So, <laughs> those hopefully this kind of gives you a sense uh, a, a wide variety of challenges that face us today. It does, and. Unfortunately, we are at the end of our time. And so what I'm going to do is hand it back over to Peter. But Phil, I would love to have another webinar with you because there were approximately maybe seven other things that we wanted to talk about today. And it's been so interesting. You, br you brought me back to my world and days of being a practitioner in the field. And I loved having this conversation with you and appreciate it so much. So Thank you again for your time. Thank you to the listeners. And I'll hand it back over to you, Peter. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Phil. Um, very uh, enlightening conversation. I appreciate it. Um, I threw up a quick polling question. Uh, looks like you guys have already caught on and you're already answering it. Um, but the question is basically, are you interested in, in engaging with prevalent to, to uh, hear a little bit more and uh, to 
get you engaged in a free business resilience assessment to benchmark your third-party risk program. Uh, so please answer that poll. Um, and once again, thank you so much, Phil. Uh, thank you, Brenda. And uh, we'll see everybody on the next webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, everyone, please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.